Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. A quick word about the show's sponsors, The Red Giraffe Solutions. If you haven't visited the website, theredgiraffesolutions.com, go and have a look because if you're a parent of a young person with additional needs, there are some great free resources there to download. It's a solo episode this week to finish the Ways into Work series that's been running over the last eight weeks where we've talked about supported internships, traineeships, apprenticeships, supported employment, inclusive job boards, the role of communities and networks, and changing the narrative around work. But this isn't a summary as such, because honestly, why would you listen to me when you can go back over the last eight episodes and pretty much get everything you need to know in there from the experts in every area that was covered? This is more about the wider issues that need addressing if we are to get to that point where our young people can find a way into work so much easier than they do right now. I wanted to break this into two sections, perceptions and parents, and talk about each of these in the context of work and what I've learned over the last eight episodes, and I suppose as well what I've learned over the last four years of doing this podcast. So perceptions. I want to start with a saying that I'd actually never heard before, which is the soft bigotry of low expectations, which Jane actually talked about. I genuinely never heard this before. And when I researched it, I found it was a term coined in relation to racial inequality. When you think about it, it could actually apply to any situation where there's low expectations about an individual or a group. And from that, you ultimately get inequality. One of the reasons I like the presumption of employment saying so much is because that is about the certainty that one day a person will get a job. Just a quick quote here from Mark Twain, which I believe is very much true for my own daughter. To live a fulfilled life, we need to keep creating the what is next of our lives. Without dreams and goals, there is no living, only merely existing. And that is not why we are here. Changing perceptions, well, that's a fairly large goal, isn't it? But in this series, I got the impression that there's enough people out there focused on doing this. So as a parent, I can be optimistic. I think the model and the way forward as well was shown in a recent video from the hiring chain, which if you haven't seen it, I'll put a link in the show notes. Basically, it's a video showing exactly how easy it is to alter perceptions, because what we see every day, we come to believe. How many people believe young people with additional needs can only do certain things? And how easy is it to change that by simply having more young people with additional needs working alongside everyone else in the workplace so that those people realise that they don't fit those stereotypes, those preconceptions that they had. And in doing that, we're going to help people rethink their assumptions. But of course, there's some way to go. And it was a little bit worrying that Kirsty talked about her experiences around how many people, and more scarily, I think, some people that were actually supporting young people in the workplace that they still had that rain man stereotype. What is needed there is to remind people of the statement, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And that equally applies to any additional need. And in fact, it applies to every single one of us. But returning to that presumption of employment idea, because Richard really touched on that quite a bit when he talked about young people coming to him and not actually having that work mindset, not thinking about what roles they might do and not having really thought that they would one day get a job because it's not a conversation they'd had. It's not the case for most young people because throughout their education, the conversations are always around when you leave home, get a job, but those aren't the same conversations that children with additional needs have. We talk of this cliff edge scenario for a reason because often when they do finish education, there is no obvious next step for them. I think this also relates to us adopting something more akin to the social model of disability that really says that people are disabled by the barriers, not by their impairment or their difference. Barriers to work are actually caused by people's attitudes to difference, like assuming that young people with additional needs can't do certain jobs. The one thing that all my guests had in common was this understanding that there's a need to change perceptions, particularly with employers, through engaging with them. And the value of employer engagement was touched upon in virtually every interview in the series. Claire, David and Mark talked about the importance of this in length and saw it as a key part of what their organisations need to do Because changing the employer's perceptions ultimately leads to jobs, which leads to people within that organisation meeting someone who has an additional need and realising that their preconceived ideas and at worst their stereotypes were incorrect. Everyone deserves to be judged as an individual, not by the label that they might have been given when they were born or maybe even later. 
And that's not to say that those labels don't play some small role because they may become useful when it comes to helping people in making those so-called reasonable adjustments. But again, this is about perception. What is a reasonable adjustment? Some people seem to think that is going to be complicated and expensive, when in most cases that simply isn't true. And on that, as a society, we need to question if an organisation didn't feel it was appropriate to make a reasonable adjustment to help an individual, whether they had an additional need or not, what kind of employer they were. A good employer always wants the best out of their employees. And in fact, in many workplaces, there are adjustments being made daily by employers who value the people who work for them. So how do we help change perceptions? Well, in short, very slowly and deliberately, and through people and organisations like the ones in this series, who share a passion to make employers see they need to become more inclusive for societal, but also ultimately for economic reasons. Why ignore a group of motivated people who can fill skill gaps in your organisation? So on to parents. Now I want to start before I say anything. If you're a parent with a child with additional needs, you are awesome. I really mean that because although I know the journey has been different for all of us, what we have in common is that it's been hard, not challenging, just plain hard and frustrating and angering at times. And as Claire mentioned, for many of us, the focus is so much on medical issues or finding a school where our child can progress or just be safe and just get that basic education that everyone else seems to be able to get, but we can't. So in terms of the future, we often don't start to think about that because like many people, I tried to ignore it. But over the last four years, I've realised that that was a mistake. It's meant a lot more work to get my daughter to the place where she is now, especially when it comes to presumption of employment, but we're getting there. And looking back, I never had those conversations with my daughter that I had with my older daughter. Because with my eldest, there were many presumptions. She would leave home, she would be independent, she would find a paid job, and she's done these things all very well. As a parent, we set the benchmark. If we have presumption of employment, then it's much more likely our child will have that too. This is not an invitation to be unrealistic about what our children can achieve. In fact, we have a responsibility to help our children understand why certain jobs may not work for them. And we are doing them a disservice if we're not completely honest with them. And you know your child, so I'd urge you to listen back to each of these episodes and start to explore which of these options is relevant for your child. But also have those conversations around work and around possibilities. We all want the best for our children and we want them to have a purpose to have a fulfilling life and if that purpose can be a paid one well that's even better thanks for listening i hope you got some ideas over the last weeks which you can use to help your child reach their potential and achieve the level of independence that's right for them if you'd like to leave a review for the podcast that would be amazing five stars and above are my preference of course please connect with me on social media linkedin is where i tend to be most but I'm out there on most of them, so just search Deborah Caldo. Thank you and bye for now. <laughs>